Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security aficionado, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting August 11th, 2014. So first, let me apologize for skipping an episode last week. I've been traveling the past two weeks, including attending Black Hat and part of DEF CON last week. I had hoped to release a video about Black Hat while I was there, but I simply didn't have enough time to do it. To make up for that, I'm going to do a quick Black Hat summary. I'm not going to go over all the talks in a lot of detail. If you want more information, hopefully you follow the WatchGuard Security Center blog, where I posted a few blog posts that summarized all the actual presentation I attended during this very important security conference. Besides that, I just want to share some themes. I mean, some of the big overall themes. One was the Internet of Things or embedded devices. And there's all kinds of talks about embedded devices, whether they be cars, uh, baby monitors, video camera systems, NAS storage systems, Soho routers, USB keys, any type of device that doesn't look like a computer but actually runs software on it is a potential whole for security vulnerabilities. Anyways, one of the big takeaways I took from listening to all these embedded device talks is the software running on these embedded devices is often very, very vulnerable. In general, some of the vulnerabilities found on these embedded devices were circa 2000 type vulnerabilities. For instance, you might remember back when Microsoft suffered lots of very basic buffer overflow vulnerabilities or very easy to find software flaws in the software but over time, researchers have really hammered at normal computer software and have found all the low-hanging vulnerabilities. So today's software vulnerabilities are typically more complex. However, embedded devices are different. Since it seems like there's not a lot of researchers really auditing the security of the embedded device code, there seems to be a lot of very easy to find vulnerabilities in these embedded devices. So the takeaway here is as you start to buy more types of embedded systems, whether they be voice over IP phones, printers, or whatever, you may want to take some time to audit the security of the devices you choose to buy. Researchers are starting to dive into this, so I expect embedded device code to get more secure over time, but it's a good idea to see if the device you're looking at has had many vulnerabilities in the past. Well, that's all I really have time to summarize right now, but do know if you want to know more about the conference, be sure to check out my summary posts. And there's some good news. Black Hat has actually released YouTube videos of some of the full presentations for free, including many of the ones I attended myself. So if you're interested in seeing these presentations, check out the post associated with this video for links to all those YouTube videos. So I can't complete this week's video without talking about Patch Day. As usual, this Tuesday was Microsoft Patch Day and they released fixes for Windows, Internet Explorer, Office packages like OneNote and SharePoint Server, and SQL Server. Two of the security bulletins were rated critical, the Internet Explorer one and one that fixed a media player or media center vulnerability in Windows. So be sure to go get those patches. On top of that, Apple also released a Safari update that fixed drive-by download vulnerability. Last week, uh, OpenSSL released another OpenSSL security update, although it's not quite as critical as some of the ones they released in the past. And finally, Adobe shares Microsoft Patch Day. They released fixes for Reader and Flash, so be sure to get your Adobe updates as well. Next up, I want to quickly comment on a story from last week. Besides Black Hat and DEF CON, one of the big stories last week was news that a Russian cyber gang group had stolen 1.2 billion user credentials. This story broke because of research apparently from a, a firm called Hold Security. According to Hold Security, they had actually gained access to a Russian cyber gang's command and control infrastructure and found just tons and tons of information, a repository of stolen data. They actually 
actually found 4 billion different user credentials, but after getting rid of all the duplicates, they found that these bad guys had uh, credentials for at least 1.2 billion users. And these bad guys had been using botnets to steal this information from hundreds and hundreds of thousands of websites using automated SQL injection attacks. So this sounds like very big news, but it is somewhat suspicious as well, since Hold Security, the, the organization that found it, hasn't released any details about it. They haven't released any sample information or any dump information. So we're really going by their word that these bad guys have the 1.2 million credentials and that they're not really old leaks that have happened long ago. It's really, really hard to say. Now, other security pundits like Brian Krebs have actually backed Hold Security and said that they're a very good security company. I have heard of this company before and the information is good. But what Brian didn't share is he's actually on this company's advisory board, which is kind of suspicious. On top of that, Hold Security has offered a subscription service for $120 a month that lets you know if your company is vulnerable to this. So for them to say that they have all this information but not to share it freely is kind of weird. Now, all that said, you know, bad guys do steal passwords all the time. It is very possible that this is true. So personally, I don't think it's a bad idea to change your passwords. Some people think you should change your passwords occasionally. More importantly, you should always use different strong passwords at every website. And really, the only way for humans to do this effectively is using password vaults. So if you haven't taken the time to use a password vault and make sure you have a different password on every single website out there, this is probably a good time to do that. The final story this week comes from an interview with Edward Snowden by Wired magazine. One of Wired journalists had the lucky honor of actually interviewing Edward Snowden in Moscow in person this week, and it's a fascinating interview. There'll be a link to it in the blog post associated with this video. But some of the takeaways in this particular interview were quite interesting. Snowden actually mentioned another NSA campaign called Monster Mind. This is a system that the NSA was apparently making to do automatic strike back. This means it's an automated system as it detected attacks against NSA in metadata of all the traffic they scan, the system would automatically actually go back and enumerate or maybe even attack back the hacker that supposedly was attacking them. Now, as you probably know, I personally believe strike back is a horrible idea. Attribution is very, very difficult on the internet. In fact, most smart attackers are not attacking from their own computer. They're attacking from botnets. So your attacker may be some grandma's computer in Kansas or some college network computer that doesn't even know it's infected. So the NSA could be attacking U.S. citizen computers that, that are just infected with botnets. So I think MonsterMind is a horrible idea. Besides that tidbit of information, Snowden also mentioned how he thinks the U.S. government is responsible for at least one of the power outages in Syria in 2012. Now, I don't really put a lot of weight on this particular note since it actually isn't backed up. You know, most of Snowden's information is backed up by the documents he's actually gathered from the NSA. But this particular 2012 information is kind of based on some hearsay uh, that he had from other colleagues. So I'm not sure if it's as accurate as his other disclosures. In any case, it was a very interesting interview. If you want to read it, be sure to check the reference section in the blog post associated with this video. So that's it for this week. I hope you found it interesting or entertaining. And as usual, there's a ton of other news. In fact, in this week's reference section, I have two weeks of news since I missed last week's video. So be sure to check it out in the blog post associated with this video. And you can, of course, find that blog post on WatchGuardSecurityCenter.com. If you don't visit that regularly or subscribe to it, be sure to do so as I post stories all throughout the week besides just this video. Finally, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuard Tech. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.